Um, so Tori, tell us a little bit, a uh, little bit about yourself, um, your family growing up, uh, mom, dad, brothers and sisters, um, things of that nature. All right, sounds great. Um, I had a really tight family when I was growing up. Um, I have two sisters, uh, one of them who's three years older. Uh, her name's Jenny, and then one who's two years younger named Jesse. Um, my parents enjoy all sorts of <clears throat> outdoor activities, but they don't compete in races, uh, just never really into the competitive side of things, but they uh, like to bike, canoe, camp, ski, hike. Um, and then my older sister took up cross-country running and skiing when she got to junior high. And that ended up being uh, kind of my primary reason for joining these sports is because I kind of wanted to prove that I could do them just as well as she could. So she was sort of my older sister, Jenny, was sort of my inspiration to getting into sports. Um, I also kind of remember some early days with our family kind of going on some family runs. And I remember my dad in blue jeans and Chuck Taylors going on seven or eight mile runs when we were first kind of getting going on this as a family. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. Um, what about your parents? Um, did you, uh, always live in Hastings or, um, did you grow up there, uh, move there eventually or how'd that work? I spent my whole childhood, uh, birth through high birth through senior year, all in Hastings. Um, we were, we lived, um, on the South end of town on forest street, um, until I was about a sophomore. And then we moved just north of town um, along the bluff of the Mississippi in from the Point Restaurant for my last couple of years of high school. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. Um, next question here. Uh, what was your, maybe the best or your earliest sports memory um, growing up as a kid? Well, I've got a pretty funny one. It wasn't related to the sports that I, that I ended up succeeding in. Um, but when I was pretty little, I was playing little league baseball. And my mom has a newspaper clipping of me running from first base to second base. And I picked up first base and carried it when I ran to second base. And I had the idea that if I ran with the base, uh, they wouldn't be able to tag me out. I don't really remember that, uh, but I remember it through the newspaper clipping. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you guys have that on your fridge or anything like that? or? Oh, it probably or... was at one time. My, okay. my mom has a lot of scrapbooks and it's certainly in a, in a scrapbook. That's awesome. Oh, that's super cool. Um, growing up too, uh, was your kind of first job or maybe some jobs you had kind of throughout high school or maybe just early jobs too you had? Yeah, well, the first one that really sticks it out in my mind, um, I'm not sure exactly what age I would have been. I think uh, roughly fifth and sixth grade in that time frame. And I'm not sure if it was one or two summers, but I did some corn detasseling. And you had to report real early in the morning. And I remember you had to listen over the radio to see if they called your crew's number. And then you'd show up at the park and they'd bust you out to the cornfields. And it was the most horrendous work that you could ever do. It was hot and humid and you're walking through scratchy corn. And I remember I was a really small little kid and I remember getting picked on by kids bigger than me. And uh, and I remember that I only made about $3.35 an hour, if I remember that number correctly. So it, it was really not a great first job. <laughs> That's awesome. How'd you get uh, associated with that? Or how'd you get hooked up with that job? You know, I have no idea. I think that just a lot of kids kind of got roped into it. Um, and then um, I ended up moving up to a little bit of a better job. One of my friend's dads uh, owned some apartments. And so I did some apartment maintenance and when I started doing that, I did some landscaping and plumbing, and that was actually a really good experience. I made a little more money, and I learned a few skills, and and that that was a much better summer job that I did for a couple of years. That's awesome. I thought you were going to say uh, rock picking was your next uh, job up from detasseling corn, but no, that's uh, that's usually maybe one step down from that, so I don't know. Oh, well, that would probably be a step up, actually. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so since you grew up in town, maybe go through... Uh, your history with Hastings schools to um, what elementary we have a few here in town. Um, what kind of elementary you went to, which one you went to uh, the middle school, high school, um, things like that. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so like I said, I grew up um, down on, on forest street in the South end of town. Um, not too far from the mill, um, pretty near the intersection of 19th and forest. And I went to Cooper Elementary School and me and my friends would walk there every day and I had a, a nice little group of neighborhood friends and we got ourselves into all sorts of trouble. Um, but uh, it was nice being able to walk right to school and um, I believe that Cooper has been closed for a little while. I'm not sure what its mm -hmm. current status is. Uh, I don't get back Daycare. to Hastings too often. Daycare center now, yeah. 
It is okay. Yeah. So it's not functioning as a, as an elementary school, but anyway, that's where I went to elementary. Um, then I went to the junior high and that was when the junior high was located over by Todd field. Um, and that was very good to me. And then I went to the high school and that was back when the high school was where the current middle school is. And then I graduated from high school in 1991. And I mentioned a little bit about my parents. Um, my dad, Bob Craftson is pretty well known in Hastings. He taught um, in the schools for 35 years. Um, most of that time he was teaching as a high school social studies teacher. He did a little bit at the, at the junior high before that. So a lot, of, a lot of people who grew up in Hastings during that era um, know my dad as a social studies teacher. And he also did some, some coaching, some football coaching and some uh, girls swimming coaching. Well, that's awesome. Oh, that's super cool. I didn't, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Um, next thing, maybe starting off, uh, maybe early on, you talked about your sisters getting you into sports and stuff and, and the kind of sports they were interested in, but, um, and, and you talked about playing baseball too at a young age, but maybe walk us through uh, your sports journey kind of from youth and then um, maybe kind of right into high school and, and then um, kind of what sports went by the wayside and what sports you kind of got serious about and, and uh, how you got serious about them and where that kind of took you to. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, you know, when I was younger, I did kind of all the traditional kind of ball sports. Um, I did some football, some baseball, soccer, basketball. I didn't do any of them at a real serious level, no traveling or anything like that. Just kind of, um, you know, uh, community, community sports. Um, what was it called back then? Hastings Valley Athletic Association or something, I think, HVAA. Um, and I don't think I showed a ton of promise in any of those sports, but at least they got me active and, and got me out of the house a little bit. When I got to me, when I got to my upper elementary years, um, I, I did quite a bit of swimming and I had pretty good success in the pool. Um, from there, I started playing some tennis um, and in junior high, I played tennis and I did pretty well with that. Um, I had a lot of success. I wasn't someone who hit the ball really hard. I kind of became known as a, as a defensive player. I would kind of hit lobs over people's heads whenever they came to the net. And I was known for just hitting the ball back over and over again. And um, people didn't really like to play with me because I sort of made them lose rather than me winning. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, I did pretty well at it. I still really love the sport of tennis. I think uh, tennis players are some of the best athletes in the world with their mix of athleticism and quickness and endurance. I, I love the sport, but I, I kind of gave it up um, after junior high. Um, kind of in my junior high years, that's also when I started cross country skiing. And I think I started that uh, right away in seventh grade. And I found pretty quick success in cross country skiing. I had been doing a little bit of it just on family outings um, prior to joining the junior high team. But I started working pretty hard. Some of my friends would build jumps and just take jumps and kind of screw around. And I decided, you know, I kind of want to see where I can go with this. And so I, I worked pretty hard and, and started uh, training, trying to catch up with the varsity guys. And by the end of my seventh grade year, I actually made the varsity team. Um, and there were some really exceptional upperclassmen on the team that year, a group of several of them. Um, the leader of that group was Mark O'Connor. And they led us to a team runner-up performance at the state meet. And Mark O'Connor went on to ski in college at Northern Michigan U University. And I'm actually, I still know him. Um, his son and my son kind of compete with each other. Um, so it's kind of a small world in cross-country skiing sometimes. Um, but those guys, those upperclassmen, my seventh grade year, were really an inspiration to me to kind of help me take it seriously and just kind of see um, where I could go with the sport if I stayed with it. Um, I also played a little bit of soccer during those days. Um, I think maybe seventh grade year I played soccer. And then I believe eighth grade year, I started running cross country. Um, and I found some pretty early success there too. I put a, put a lot of time in and really jumped right in. Um, Craig Greenslit was a senior when I was an eighth grader and he was another huge inspiration to me. Um, he went on to win the cross country running state championship that fall. And he was also a track star, um, a great miler and two miler. And he was really an inspiration to me. Um, and during those days of running, I saw my 5K times. Um, at that time, everybody ran 5K. These days, they have the middle school kids running usually two kilometer, a shorter distance. But at that time, everybody ran a 5K. Um, and my times were dropping pretty quickly. And uh, I was able to kind of see a lot of progress. Uh, Mr. Minert, the coach at the time, would keep these spreadsheets of kind of what our times were. And I was really driven by seeing my time's going down. 
And like I said, also seeing Craig Greensled and some of the older runners were a big in, were a big focus for me. So I think, um, you know, having some guys like Mark O'Connor and Craig Greensled who were super successful when I was a young athlete played a big part in me and kind of um, helping me kind of get the the intrinsic drive and focus to really start taking it seriously and have the motivation to see where I could go with it in future years. Oh, oh that's awesome. Yeah. So, um, so you said cross country, you started in seventh grade and or uh, Nordic, you started in seventh grade and then cross country in eighth grade. I believe that's right. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. I'm 90% certain those are correct. Anyway, it was a long time ago. <laughs> did, did you find a lot of, I mean, I know you said you, you found a lot of success with Nordic right away, but um, was it what uh, it seems like talking to kids now, um, some of them that just kind of start out for the first time, it's just super challenging for them. You know, um, we, did you find any challenges like that? Or you were just kind of able to jump right in right away and, and kind of hit the ground running? You know, I did find a lot of early success. I think there's a couple things right now that make it a little bit more challenging. Um, when I was doing it, there was a period of time in Nordic skiing when um, skating started becoming a thing and classic skiing sort of went away for a number of years. So in the years that I was in um, junior high and in high school, we were only skating as a part of our high school skiing. And skating is kind of one of the two two main techniques in, in Nordic skiing. Um, and so I think it was a little bit easier. I only had to learn skate technique. Um, so it, it, the, the technique part of it wasn't quite as involved. And I think the other thing that really helped me is skating is a little more driven with your legs, um, not quite as much emphasis on your upper body. And I was a real scrawny little guy and my um, upper body, my scrawny little upper body didn't hold me back as much in skating. I think if I had been, you know, now, um, now the races are split between classical and skating and at this, at the conference section and state meet, they do a pursuit race where they combine the two and the classical skiing, um, is much more emphasis on the upper body. You really got to be a bit stronger to find good success in it. And most of the successful skiers you see are, are fairly well built, maybe not quite like a football player, but, um, they're, they're usually pretty strong guys. Um, once, especially once they get to be upperclassmen. Um, so I think I would have had a harder time in today's environment if, uh, if I was, if I was starting now. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, yeah. So that took us to, uh, just about eighth grade there. And then, um, let's start maybe in ninth grade. Um, I, I know you started, you kept on going with, uh, with, with obviously Nordic and cross country. So, um, yeah, let's go through maybe the ninth through 12th grades right now. And then any your sports history through that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think maybe the next big change I made was, you know, I played tennis through those junior high years um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think I felt like I kind of needed to be involved more in endurance sports on a year round basis. And some of my friends were involved in track. So I sort of felt almost compelled to get involved in track. So my, my high school, I kind of added track during my spring seasons. And I never really had quite as much passion for that. You end up going around in circles a lot and, and you tend to do, it's tends to favor people that have a little bit more leg speed. And I never, I was a little more strong in the endurance side and not so much with the leg speed. So I did well in track, um, but it wasn't really my favorite. And like I said, I did it more under compulsion. Um, but in high school, I had a lot of success in all three sports. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, let's walk, maybe walk through each year too. So like uh, maybe each year with each sport then. So ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th and 12th with uh, cross country and Nordic then. Sure. Um, so yeah, I was involved in, in all three and, you know, I got to go to state and cross country skiing my seventh grade year as a part of a team. And I kind of talked about that. And then I actually didn't make it back to the state need in either eighth grade or ninth grade. Um, so I sort of jumped into skiing right here, but I'll kind of stick with that. But um, so my sophomore year, we had a really strong uh, cross country ski team. Um, again, there were a couple of seniors on that team that were uh, just a huge part of it. And um, and we really gelled really well as a group. We trained a lot in the off season. We were all really committed to it. Um, and we just had a really a, a strong team with some really tight bonds and just a high level at, of athleticism. And during that sophomore year of mine, we all kind of traded places throughout the year. Um, some of us would win one race, somebody else would win another race. Um, so it was really kind of fun and exciting. Um, 
And by the time we got to the state meet, um, I hadn't really won any of the big races. I'd sort of been right there in a bunch of them, maybe second or third in a bunch of the big races. Um, but it, everything just kind of came together for me at the state meet that year when I was a sophomore. And I won the state meet as an individual my sophomore year, um, which was a surprise to me as well as to everybody else, I think. And uh, our team also won the state meet there. Um, and that would have been in 1989. So that was super exciting. It was one of the, that, that uh, winning the state meet as a team was one of my certain highlights and also as an individual. Um, you know, I was doing well during that sophomore year in running um, cross country and in track. I don't really remember any particular standout results other than that my times were continuing to improve. Um, forwarding then to my junior year, um, I made it to the state meet in cross country running the fall of my junior year. And um, my team was doing pretty well. Um, we had some really strong teammates and I believe I was fifth as an individual at the state meet in, the, in my junior year in cross country. Um, moving into the ski season that year, um, I was favored to win after having won the previous year. Um, I did have a little bit of sickness to contend with kind of late in the year, and um, I did end up winning the state meet, but it was one of the most interesting years. Um, I tied with another guy, um, a guy from Cloquet. We actually, and that was when they were starting one skier every 30 seconds, so it was just you against the clock. Um, we call that an interval start in cross-country skiing, and we actually had exactly the same time. And the chances of that are just incredibly remote. <laughs> so it was really amazing. They had no way to break the tie. So they gave us both a, a medal um, to, for first place at state uh, my junior year there. Um, fast forwarding then to my senior year, um, our, our running team was really running well. Um, my friend Dan Johnson and I won a lot of the invitationals throughout the year. Um, we put in a ton of volume. Um, and we were poised to be one of the contenders uh, to win the state meet as a team my senior year in cross country. Unfortunately, Dan got a stress fracture in the week or two leading up to the state meet. And he ran in the state meet, but he was sort of hobbling around with a stress fracture. And I believe he ended up second to last in the meet. And of course, that really hurt our team's performance, having you know one of our top guys being so far down in the results. Um, I, I won the state meet. It was a really exciting meet for me, but it was also a little bit diminished by the fact that my friend Dan wasn't there with me. Um, and uh, as a team, we still ended up getting third. So we did have a really strong team. Dan's younger brother, Eric, was a big part of that team. That's awesome. And then uh, senior year in cross country skiing, um, had a really strong year. I won the state meet um, as an individual again. So I ended up winning the state meet in cross country skiing three different times. Um, and then I had the opportunity to go compete at Junior Nationals in Alaska, and I won one of the races at Junior Nationals in Alaska, and that really opened doors for me for kind of where I wanted to go at college, and we can leave that for a future question for a, a talk about a little bit down the road here. Um, and then finally, uh, senior year in track, um, I was definitely one of the better two milers. Um, like I said, I was a little more of a distance guy as opposed to a shorter distance guy. Um, but I really carried a lot of pressure into that senior track season. There were a few reporters that were kind of putting some pressure on me to three-peat and win cross-country running, cross-country skiing and track and kind of talking about how few people had done that. And I really did feel that pressure and it kind of took some of the enjoyment out of it for me. Um, I did end up running at state and doing well and I got third and I was happy with that. I didn't consider myself quite as strong in track, but it, it was definitely a little bit of pressure in that senior track season for me. Wow. That's really cool. Um, did you have um, any major setbacks or injuries or anything like that throughout high school? Um, you know, not, not, not very much at all. Um, almost no injuries to speak of. I was super healthy. Um, never had any serious injuries to speak of actually. And, and really it was just kind of a steady progression every year. I trained a little bit more and just kind of built and built and built. And I think there were a few good reasons that I stayed healthy. One of them was that when we did a lot of our running, which can put a lot of impact on your body, um, we worked really hard to do it um, on soft surfaces. We did a lot of our runs on the gravel roads uh, um, on the west side of town. We'd go out and do a lot of our running on Jacob Avenue. We'd go to a lot of trail systems at Afton State Park and run on the grass. 
and I really attribute that to helping me stay healthy and not having any major injuries. Well, that's awesome. Um, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I should double check this, but your, uh, your state championship pitcher in the hallway, is that, that's you with the, the winter hat on and gloves, right? Was it snowing one of the years that you won it or no? It is sure you, right? was. Okay. And I actually, okay. that was, I, I definitely enjoyed that. Um, that was uh, 1990, which I believe was the last year that they held the state cross country meet at the U of M golf course. They had been doing it there for a long time. And uh, that day there was definitely at least a couple inches of snow on the ground. Um, my recollection, it was maybe even three or four. Um, but yeah, there was definitely snowfall and it definitely changed the dynamic of the race. Um, I was happy about it because I'm a cross country skier and I love the snow, but I remember we were running in really long spikes, like one inch long, and we sprayed them down with WD-40 so they wouldn't get ice on them. <laughs> but the times were pretty slow. If you look back at the times from that year, my winning time wasn't a particularly fast time because we were running in three or four inches of snow. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Um, wow. That, that is really nuts. Uh, so you might have already talked about this too, but, um, maybe it was at, I think the 1989, um, cross country team you talked about, but, um, maybe talk about, uh, your favorite memory, um, moment from a high school or from high school, um, as an athlete. Yeah. Um, you know, that winning that meet was definitely rewarding. I would say one of the things I would just talk about is, um, I really had a huge emphasis and this was part of, part of an influence was from one of the coaches that I worked a little bit with, uh, named Rick, Rick Callies really instilled in me this importance of just doing a lot of volume and, and, and just being out there doing a lot of running, a lot of roller skiing, a lot of bike riding, and just putting in lots and lots of time and more of a focus on quantity than quality. I certainly did some quality training as well, but I put an emphasis on just being out there a lot. Um, and, and that built year after year. And I think to a lot of people that might sound like just lots of work and no fun. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I love being out in the woods. I love being on trails and I loved training with teammates. I spent time at Afton state park and cottage Grove Ravine regional park and some beautiful places. I also really loved just kind of pushing my body and see it improve. And so training was a lot of things for me. It was enjoying the outdoors. It was a social outlet. It was pushing my body. Um, I also did a, a fair amount of that training with family. Sometimes my parents would ride a bike while I was running. Um, I got to go out with my sisters when I was younger. It would have been my older sister. And then when I was older, my younger sister um, would go out with me during a lot of the workouts. Um, so I was really competitive and wanted to win, but I really enjoyed just the day-to-day -day aspect of the training. And so I would say that was almost the most rewarding thing for me. And um, I think I saw it in the hallway the right way. Uh, one of your sisters was Allstate as well, right? Yeah, um, my sister, Jessie, you know, um, I don't remember her place, but I want to say, I kind of want to say it was a sixth place, but uh, don't quote me on that. But yeah, both my sisters were actually quite successful. My older sister was pretty successful. I don't think she ever had quite the finish she wanted at a state meet, but she was certainly a top ranked skier in the state. And my younger sister was as well. That's awesome. Um, I, I, a quick little sidebar. I remember yeah. being up at that junior nationals that I mentioned up in Alaska and my younger sister, Jessie was up there with me. And I remember I was out watching her in one of the relay races and some of the coaches from Alaska um, were kind of wondering who this Midwest girl was, who was mm -hmm. making up time on, on the other teams. And my sister skied by and they're like, man, who was that girl? And I was like, ah, that's my sister. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that is super cool. Um, I'll fast forward a little bit and then um, we'll, we'll kind of get back to where we, we are in the questions. Um, so you, you talked about going to that junior national tournament and that was kind of a, a big uh, kind of moment for you too. So um, you kind of get done with high school then um, maybe walk us through the recruiting process um, for college and um, what you, where you wanted to go, um, who's kind of talking to you and then maybe um, how you landed at Utah. Sure. Um yeah, um, that whole recruiting process um, was a bit interesting. Um, I really had a desire that was it had been in, in me for several years, I would say, to compete at one of the bigger Division I ski programs. Um, and, and at that time, and they're really still a lot of the same programs, um, it was kind of the University of Utah, um, Vermont, and I kind of wanted to go to one of those big name D1 programs. Um, the challenge I was having is even though I was really successful in Minnesota State High School, 
Um, those D1 colleges aren't really looking at your state results. They want to see some national level results. And I, I didn't go to junior nationals my junior year, partly because of the money aspect. It was kind of expensive. It was in Colorado and it was up at altitude and I didn't know how the altitude would, would work for me. So I didn't really have national level results at all my junior year. So these coaches at, at the big schools like Utah weren't really talking to me. But then finally, when I won a race at junior nationals in Alaska my senior year, um, then they were recruiting me and talking to me. And so then I had the opportunity to go to the University of Utah. They made, made me an offer that I accepted. Um, I, I, I was kind of keeping my options open all through that time and I didn't make a decision till late in my senior year and that was kind of stressful. I think I had seven schools that I was kind of choosing between. And initially when I was going to go to the University of Utah, I was only going to ski, um, but they ended up having kind of a mix up with my scholarship. I ended up getting some athletics, some academic scholarship and they gave my skiing scholarship to another athlete, but the um, academic scholarship was really only covering part of my tuition. So to make a long story short, um, I ended up running in college as well, and they kind of helped pay my scholarship. So I was able to both run and ski at the University of Utah. That's awesome. Um, and then we'll, uh, let's go through your college career then, since we're, <laughs> we're here right now at Utah. So uh, maybe walk us through um, the sports you played then at Utah, the years you, you played them, and then um, kind of successes you had, or, or maybe setbacks as well that you had with these sports. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, so I ran and skied um, at the University of Utah, and going in my freshman year, um, in the fall, a lot of times I would um, do a running workout like early in the afternoon, and then I'd go to a cross-country skiing workout later in the afternoon, so I was doing just a a ton of volume, a ton of work. And as it turns out, it sort of did catch up with me. Maybe some of it was kind of the transition to college and being at altitude and a number of different factors. I had a really good running season. Um, I was, uh, I believe I'm, I believe I was the top freshman in the Western Athletic Conference. Um, I didn't make it to nationals, but I was pretty close and really had a very, some pretty high level running racing. Um, I think I ran a 10K in like 31.15 at the regional meet my freshman year, which is a pretty fast 10K time. Um, and then going into the ski season, I, I started out really well. The first weekend went really well. And then sort of all of a sudden, it really caught up with me. And um, I sort of had this physical burnout where I my racing just kind of went down the tubes and I started feeling tired and sleeping 15 hours a night and I was just getting tired even walking up to school. It was really a pretty drastic burnout that I suffered. And I didn't really know what it was that I was going through. Fortunately, I had a college coach who was really supportive and helped me um, go see a physician at the end of the season who kind of diagnosed it as, uh, as an athletic burnout and gave me a recommendation to really take several months of time off, which I did. Um, and like I said, I'm really fortunate that my ski coach kind of really stood by me and supported me during that time. Coming back from that burnout period, it really took a year or two. Um, I had, you know, I had some recovery. I'd kind of get back and have some good racing. And it was kind of this roller coaster where I'd have some up races and some down races. And that lasted for a year or two. Um, and then by my senior year, I was really back to myself and having some, some really good results again. Um, kind of my highest result in cross-country skiing was a fourth place finish at the NCAA championships. Um, so that was an all-American finish. Um, and that was really a, a great accomplishment for me. Um, I had some really great teammates. A lot of them were from Norway and Sweden. Um, the, the University of Utah tends to recruit a number of foreign athletes. And I really enjoyed getting to know them and having them as teammates. Um, and on the running side, I didn't see a ton of improvement. I came in my freshman year running really pretty fast. And I kind of stayed about those same times throughout my running seasons, um, never made a nationals or anything like that, but I was pretty successful um, and really enjoyed my time running as well, getting to know teammates. Uh, most of my teammates were from Utah and built a lot of great relationships and a lot of great friendships. Um, yeah. Um, did, did a lot of guys do both sports at the same time or no? Or, uh, or what about track too? Um... Cause I know obviously you did track in high school too. So anybody do all three or just uh, the two of them or just kind of stick with one or the other? No, it was really rare. Hard, very few people tried to do both. Um, there was a Norwegian guy um, who ended up getting his American citizenship named John Alberg at university of Utah, who had done both and done both very, very well. 
Um, but nobody at the time I was doing, at the time I was competing was doing both. And I did a little bit of track racing, but not very much. Usually by the time spring rolled around, I really needed a break and I didn't do, I think there was one season I did some track, but I never really focused on it or did too much with it. Okay. Um, so you did talk about, um, some of your high school coaches and then, um, one of your college coaches as well. So, um, maybe who, who was your best coach, uh, you played for, um, what do they teach you? Um, maybe just kind of talk about You could either pick one from high school or one from college, or just maybe one of each two, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many I could choose from. I was really fortunate to work with some great coaches. I mentioned Rick Callie's name. He got me doing a lot of volume. John Dewall was my high school cross-country ski coach, certainly a great influence on me, it really inspired me and helped me along the way. Um, I would say, you know, the coach that I'll probably talk the most about was the one that kind of came up in that previous story, my coach at the University of Utah, his name was Kevin Sweeney. And uh, the reason that he was so significant to me was just that support that he gave me when I went through a burnout. Um, you know, he gave me some hugs and I cried on his shoulder a, a number of times. and. I think, you know, some coaches might have said, hey, what's going on with you? Get it together and been a little more harsh about the whole thing and, and uh, you know, maybe not supported me in the way that he did. Um, and I think I, if he hadn't have been so supportive, I think I probably would have walked away from the sport entirely at, a, at that time. But his support and his encouragement um, really inspired me to keep going with it, to, to get through it and to get back to racing well again. Um, I learned a lot just from his example in the way to treat athletes, to treat athletes as a whole person and to really support them in their ups and downs, to value them as human beings and not just for performance. Um, so as I got into doing some coaching myself, um, he was really just a great example for me of how I wanted to treat people when I, when I did some coaching. That's awesome. Um, and then Maybe we'll talk about, uh, since we talked about coaches, um, maybe a favorite teammate of yours or someone that um, I know you, you kind of mentioned a lot of the, the bigger names that we've had um, throughout our uh, cross country program too, but um, maybe who was the best teammate um, you played with or ran with um, throughout your high school career or your college career too? Yeah. And again, there could be quite a number on that list because I had a lot of great teammates. Uh, I mentioned a couple who inspired me kind of in my younger years. Um, that year that I was a sophomore, there were some really great guys that were an encouragement to me. Um, Jim Defoe, Mike Siebenhaler, Scott Gonterek were some really great teammates. Mike Hopkins, we were a really tight group, kind of my sophomore year in skiing. But I would say by um, the one who really, really worked uh, a lot of miles with me was Dan Johnson. Um, Dan and I um, were the same year in school. We were both really dedicated runners. We put in just miles and miles side by side. By the time we were seniors in, in high school, we were putting in 100 mile weeks almost every week. Wow. We did a lot of crazy workouts together. We'd go out to Afton and do hill repeats up the campground hill. And they've, they've since rerouted the campground hill and made it more gradual, but it used to go kind of more straight up and it was a pretty intense hill. So we'd go up and down that thing 10 or 12 times. And, um, and most of our races we ran side by side and one of the fun things about working with Dan is we, we had different strengths. Dan did have a lot of speed and he could out sprint me pretty easily. He was very, he was much better than me in track. Um, but at that 5k distance, it was sort of right at our meeting point where we were sort of stride for stride. And we were kind of our strategy when we raced was we would be friends for the first two and a half miles and really working with each other. And then that last half mile, we'd kind of throw the friendship out the window and I'd usually throw in a big surge and see if I could get ahead of him and kind of beat him to the finish line. And if he was strong enough to stay with me, then he would outsprit me in the last hundred meters. And our senior year, we were sort of about 50, 50 in our races. He'd beat me about 50% and I'd beat him about 50%. Um, so it was really fun just kind of being back and forth with him, especially my senior year, but really even all the years leading up to our senior year, we, we spent a lot of time together. And we really became good friends. We did things with each other's families um, and uh, got some crazy haircuts together. Um, and I think about, you know, this proverb that I like um, that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And I think that was really true of the relationship Dan and I had working together. We really made each other a lot stronger. Oh, that's awesome. Um, what, one question, uh, I did some... Uh a lot of uh, Zooms 
recently with uh well a couple months ago or so anyway but with uh with a lot of former athletes or college coaches too so one of the questions i was always asking them was um when they made their biggest jump in high school or college um some of them made a huge jump between one to two years um some of them made a gradual increase every single year so which one do you think it was for you um i want i won't put words in your mouth it sounds like a gradual increase uh in high school and stuff but um and maybe just talk about which one it was a gradual or uh, kind of a steep increase or a big jump. And then uh, maybe what, you, why you think that happened or what went into that? Yeah, you know, I definitely think for me, I think that's right on that. It was for me more of a gradual year by year thing. And I think, you know, a few coaches along the way really helped me with that. I have, I've kind of mentioned Rick Kelly's name who talked to me about volumes and trying to keep building and building and building. And I built up to doing some pretty huge volumes um, by the time I was a senior, I put in 900 hours of training, and that's more than a lot of the Olympian Nordic skiers are putting in or right in that realm where a lot of them are. Um, so it, it was maybe a little bit excessive, and it kind of caught up with me a little bit in college, like I talked about. But um, I did kind of gradually build up to that, and, and I just kept seeing improvement. And as I mentioned, uh, Dwayne Minert, our uh, running coach, when I was in junior high and high school, he kept these spreadsheets that I think were really helpful because they kind of showed your time improvements. And uh, so you could kind of see your times dropping and dropping and dropping both within a season and also from year to year. So I think it was just a gradual improvement year to year to year. And, and it just kind of continued for me through high school. And then, as I mentioned, it kind of continued in my college years as well, except for that period when I went through a burnout for a year or two and was kind of trying to recover from that. That was definitely a little bit of a dip in my performance. But coming out of that, I got back to racing better than ever by the time I was a junior or a senior and um, kind of finished off with my best results by uh, an All-American finish uh, at the NCAA championships my senior year in college. That's awesome. Uh, all right, next thing then. Um, off, maybe outside of sports and the, the cross-country, uh, skiing and cross-country running then. Um, you talked about maybe tennis too. Uh, maybe just hobbies or interests or things you uh, you like doing outside of sports, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and these are probably somewhat related to my sports. I just really have a passion for being outdoors and I have a lot of enjoyment of, of things. Um, I like to go hiking. I did a lot of backpacking trips, particularly when I was living out west in Utah. I like biking. I like road biking and I also enjoy mountain biking. Um, I really enjoy canoeing. I have three canoes. I have a solo canoe. I have a canoe that's a, a little more hardcore for river canoeing. And then I uh, just recently picked up another uh, lightweight canoe that's a little easier to portage for Boundary Waters trips. So I really enjoy canoeing. I enjoy camping. Um, I've done quite a few trips up in the Boundary Waters and the Quetico, and I really enjoy that. So I would say those are kind of my biggest hobbies and interests is uh, being outdoors and just doing all sorts of different activities. Awesome. So you probably graduated uh, college in about 1994, 1995. So maybe take us uh, through uh, from 1995 to about 2000 uh, and 21 here. So um, maybe uh, major while you were in high, uh, college, um, kind of maybe first jobs that you got, um, where those jobs led you um, and then maybe get into kind of your personal life too, um, wife, family, things of that nature too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I graduated, actually took me, I graduated from high school in 91, took me five years to get my civil engineering degree. And that's not real uncommon for engineers to, to spend five years. So I graduated um, with a degree in civil engineering in 1996. Part of that was I, I, uh, I was able to take some fun classes along the way. I took a chess class and a backpacking class, and I had a lot of plenty of serious classes too, but I had a little bit of fun along the way. Um, when I graduated with my civil engineering degree in 1996, um, I decided that I wanted to take a year and just sort of try to balance um, work and skiing and keep skiing um, at a pretty high level and see where that would take me. I sort of just told myself I was gonna give it one more year and see what happened. I went to the US Nationals um, that year that probably would have been in January of 1997. Um, and I was kind of coming off of being sick and I didn't race very well, came back uh, a little bit disappointed, um, kind of regrouped a little bit. And then um, kind of in February and March, of um, of that year in 1997, I had some of the best skiing. I, I won a bunch of ski marathons. They have 
uh, a whole series of Western ski marathons at that time. They called it the Great American Ski Chase. And I ended up winning the Great American Ski Chase. Um, and then I capped it um, in March by winning the national championship 50 kilometer race out in California. And that was a super exciting race. Um, and it sort of took me to this place where I decided that I was just so excited by winning that 50K national championship. I had sort of had dreams of making a US ski team, but I really felt satisfied with where I was at. And I made a very conscious decision at that point that I was gonna retire from cross country skiing. And I did, and I never looked back. It was very shortly after that, um, that, my, that my wife and I um, started dating. Um, and uh, we dated pretty intently um, and ended up, we were, uh, I was out of college and she's a few years older than me. So we were both at a stage where where we were kind of ready for things to progress. Um, and we ended up getting engaged um, within a number of months and then married um, about five or six months later. So all of that happened in a pretty short time frame. Um, and then I was working full time as a civil engineer um, out in Utah. I stayed in Utah after I graduated for a little while. Um, we had, my wife kind of intended that we would maybe wait a little while to have children, but um, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, our oldest son, Shad, was born uh, one week before our one year anniversary. So we jumped right into to kids. Um, we had our second uh, child, uh, a daughter, Raina, and she was born a couple of years later while we were living in Utah. And then um, in 2000, um, we decided we wanted to move back to Minnesota my wife's job went through a transition and we were both sort of feeling like we wanted to be around family a little bit more. So we moved back to Minnesota in 2000. I continued to work in the engineering field um, for about another eight or nine years. I had kind of a combination of working for private companies, designing housing developments and things like that. And then um, I think it was in 2007, I started working for the city of Stillwater um, as an engineer for them, designing uh, road reconstruction projects and things like that. Um, and then finally in uh, 2011, <clears throat> I was kind of feeling like I wanted to make a career change, not exactly sure what I wanted to do. Did some research and some thought, some thinking about it and decided to make a career change into teaching. That was in 2011. Um, I spent about a year and a half at Bethel University um, getting my teaching my master's in teaching, um, and I've been teaching math now. Well, kind of a math and some engineering classes through the Project Lead the Way program. So a combination of those two things for the last eight years now in the Stillwater School District. Um, I also coached the Nordic team for uh, Stillwater for 11 years from 2006 to 2017. And then I've kind of stepped away from it for these last three years. Um, so my wife, Rebecca and I, we've been married for 23 years. We have three children. I mentioned Shad and Raina were both born in Utah. And then uh, our youngest, Adric, was born after we moved back to Minnesota. Um, we've been living in Bayport, just south of Stillwater since 2001. Wow, that's quite the journey there. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, long, long journey. That's quite, quite, a, quite a bit to talk about there. And then, yeah, and then uh, the journey all the way out west and then, and then right back almost to home. Again, that's pretty cool. Um, exactly. Uh, so next one question for you. Uh, what has been your most memorable sports moment um, from coaching um, that isn't competition related? You know, I think um, this maybe isn't a specific moment, um, but I think the biggest thing for me was just building relationships with athletes. Um, I really enjoyed getting to know athletes. Um, down in my basement, we actually just did this crazy project on our house about five years ago. We live in a, on a hundred year old house and we lifted it, jacked it up and it put built a basement under it. Um, so now I've got a wax room and, and a bunch of other space down in the basement there. And I have a whole bunch of pictures um, and posters of pictures of the athletes that I worked with down there. Um, and just really still enjoy looking at those and, and remembering a lot of the people that I coached with. and. Um, and really it was my desire as a coach to really be able to instill more than just results, but to really instill character and sportsmanship and, and enjoying the sport. Um, and so I have, you know, a lot of great memories of, of time out on the trails with the athletes. And there's a lot of them that I still kind of stay in touch with and run into. And I still love kind of hearing about how they're doing. And, and a lot of them are still getting out and enjoying the sport of cross-country skiing. So 
Yeah, I would say it was just really the investment I made in the athletes that was um, probably the most memorable. That's awesome. Um, and maybe the, the same question now, um, your most memorable uh, part of coaching that is competition related. I'm going to mention two of them real quick. Um, the first one was um, in the second to last year that I was coaching, um, I was coaching an athlete um, named Sam Hansen. I had actually coached his two older brothers as well, Gabe and Nate. So I had kind of gotten to know them and their family pretty well. Sam was a very successful both runner and cross country skier. And his senior year, he skied to a fifth place finish at the 2016 Nordic State Meet, which was the highest accomplishment of any skier that I had coached and one of the highest kind of in, in Stillwater's history for an individual. And it was super exciting to watch that day um, Sam had suffered a concussion as the result of a fall um, a few weeks before that, and he had had to take a little bit of time off to recover from that concussion, and it was a little bit uncertain if he was going to be back to full form for the state meet, so it was really thrilling to be on the, co on the course that day and just seeing him kind of just having a race that was right up there with what he was capable of, and he was, he was just, uh, so that was super exciting. Another highlight was the following year, my son Shad had a really good year. He was a senior in 2017. Um, and one of my biggest memories was watching him in the section meet in the pursuit race. He finished with a one or two second lead in the morning classical race. And then he held that lead in the afternoon all the way through the freestyle race with another competitor just chasing right behind him the whole race and those two guys just stayed separated by about two seconds all the way through a 5k freestyle race and both of them were just giving it everything and it was super fun to watch and kind of the other part of that story that's really interesting is they've gone on to still be competitors of each other in college uh, they still race each other I was watching the two of them racing against each other just last weekend still and and now I've gotten to know his dad a little bit so anyway small story there <laughs> no that's awesome um, I didn't prep you for this one so you said Dewall was your uh, high school coach, and then and obviously you coached against him too um, when you were at Stillwater, and he's here in Hastings still. So maybe give us a, a maybe a, a Dewall coaching story as an athlete, and then maybe if you if you got any Dewall uh, a competitor, then as as a coaching competitor stories, you got anything good? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot like this. <laughs> okay, boy, um, Dewall. For anybody who knows him, he's just a great guy. He carries, he's got a ton of personality. He's just uh, very, very excitable. He's got a lot of energy, really a fun guy to be around, really an inspiring um, personality and really just a pleasure to work with as an athlete. Um, <laughs> there was, this is a story that I think a few of us kind of from that time frame would remember. There was a practice when we were at Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park. And there's a part of the course where you can ski along it and there's a road that's kind of just right at the kind of the horizon, um, kind of along the west side of the park, but right at dusk, you can't really see that it's a road. And there was one day um, we were out there and there was a car's taillights just kind of going on that road on the horizon, but you couldn't really see the road or tell it was a road. And Dewall just pointed, we were kind of skiing at dusk and Dewall pointed at it and there were a bunch of us standing there and Dewall's like, check it out a ufo beam me up scotty what is going on so that sort of just became our joke punchline about d wall beam me up scotty what's going on <laughs> so that was kind of a fun that was kind of a fun john d wall story and then i've got another one from when i was coaching um john might not appreciate this one quite as much but it's kind of funny hopefully he would take it in good humor if he's ever listening to this um uh, when I was coaching at Stillwater, we had a meet at Ka uh, Lake Elmo Park Reserve and Hastings was there and we were there. Um, and I was out watching on one of the hills and um, I will, I'm, I'll just back up a little bit. As I mentioned before, there was quite a, a period of time when people were only skating and then classical came back on the scene and now it's a 50-50 mix of classical style and skating style. And John um, hasn't embraced the, the classical style quite as much. Um, he used to do it all the time and he actually does it quite well, um, but I don't think he likes to mess with the waxing part of it and doesn't like to deal with it quite as much. So he tends to focus on the skating side of it. So anyway, on this particular race day, we're at Lake Elmo Park Reserve um, and uh, watching one of the Hastings athletes going up a hill on the course in a classical race. 
And I'm like, all right, go Raiders, go Raiders. I didn't know this kid's name, um, but he gets right alongside me on the hill and just looks over at me and says, tell d to teach us how to classic ski. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a ride and just sort of a comment that d a little more bigger on the skating side of things. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. No, those are good but stories. His son, I, I, I actually got to coach his son, Lars. His son, Lars, went to Stillwater High School and was very successful in both running and skiing. And his son, Lars, is currently competing in both running and skiing at the, the College of St. Scholastica. And my daughter is at the College of St. Scholastica um, so they're on the same team. So it's been fun for them to continue to get to know each other. And my son, Adric, um, was a freshman when Lars was a senior and they were pretty good friends that year. So I have all sorts of connections with John and he's a, he's a real important part of my life. Oh, that's super cool. We, uh, one of our best cross country girls and in, in Nordic girls is, uh, I think she's going to St. Uh, Scholastica next year too. So probably kind of when this is airing, she'll be there, um, at this time, I think so pretty cool. Yes. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That's really neat. Um, next question for you then. Um, almost here done wrapping up, wrapping up with you. Um, in what ways might your high school sports uh, experience still impact you today? Um, any particular lessons or takeaways uh, that are important um, to your role as a teacher? Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing for me that I learned from athletics that stands out is perseverance. Um, and especially in the, the endurance sports that I'm involved in, it just takes a lot of perseverance. You have races when things don't feel like they're going your way. Um, I remember one particular race when the conditions were just really slow and I didn't think it was going well. And it turned out I had a really good race, um, but it didn't feel very good in the middle of it and at the time. And, um, you know, you really got to learn to push through adversity. And I think that's true in any sport, but I especially uh, recognize it in the sports that I'm involved in. Um, there's a quote that I really love that I share sometimes with my students from Colin Powell that says, there are no secrets to success. It is the result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. And the reason I really like that quote is when we think about trying to be successful, we often think about the preparation part of it and the hard work part of it, but we tend to ignore that other part of it about learning from failure. Um, and I really think that is a super important part of becoming successful is being willing to go through hard times and pick up the pieces and keep on going. Um, and I would say in my career, I've really had to show some grit, um, both in, in engineering and in teaching. You know, early on, there were some really difficult experiences when you're still kind of learning and making mistakes. Um, and you really got to just show perseverance and work through those things. And I would say the same thing's been through in my teaching. Um, it's not always easy to be in front of a group of students and keep the classroom in good order. I'm sure you can probably relate to that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just really takes some perseverance. And I really think that my background in athletics has helped me with that. And maybe the last thing I was add is I would say that, you know, a marriage requires uh, some persever perseverance and commitment. It's not always, it's not always easy and, and it takes a willingness to persevere. And um, so I think those are all things that I've learned through athletics Oh, that's awesome. Um, all right. So next one here, if you could give parents or coaches two pieces of, a, a, two pieces of advice from your perspective, um, what would those two pieces of advice be and why? Okay. Um, you know, I would say the, the couple things would be particularly to um, coaches and parents who have younger kids. And by younger, I would say in the elementary years and maybe even kind of the early junior high years, I would really encourage um, parents and coaches to really focus on the fun side of things and not let the results be too, too much of a priority. Um, I, I remember my son, Adric, is, is finding a lot of success now. He's a junior in high school. But I remember we took him to a cross country race when he was about 10 years old. And he was just on some kind of beat up equipment, wide skis with fish scales on him. And he was in a snowsuit. Um, and it was, there were about 20 kids in this race and almost everybody else in this race had on Lycra racing suits and they beat him by minutes, but he was just out there smiling and having fun. And he was at a stage when, you know, what he wanted most was just to go up and down hills and bomb the hills and, and get some hot chocolate when it was done. Um, and I think I really, I think that experience of being young and enjoying it and not taking it too seriously is really valuable. I think 
you know, the, the push on traveling sports is to get kids super serious at a really young age. And I just don't think that's a very healthy dynamic. I know in some sports, it almost feels like you have to do that. And maybe you do. Um, but I really think that kids should be in just really focusing on the fun side of it when they're young. And I guess kind of along with that, I would say to really let the, let the kid set the pace. If you're really pushing um, the kid at a younger age, um, I think there's a problem there. And I think the, 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 the athlete is much more likely to go through a burnout. There's kind of a, a fine balance between encouraging um, and really pushing. And I think you want to avoid pushing a kid too much when they're young. Um, I remember with my own kids, um, just really kind of riding that balance and trying to figure it out and, and really trying hard not to push my kids when they were too young. And what was really fun to watch was they really came into their own motivation and it kind of came in their own time. And when they got that passion and that motivation, they really just ran with it. And it was super fun to watch. And it made me um, really glad that I had kind of held back and not pushed them too hard in those younger years. That's awesome. Um, last thing for you then, um, kind of same question, but to student athletes. So if you could give student athletes two pieces of advice from your perspective, uh, what would they be and why? All right. Um, first one I would tell any student athlete is to really see yourself in a holistic way. Um, and what I mean by that is to really see your life in the proper balance. You are more than just your athletics. Um, your academics are a part of who you are. Maybe you have a job that's a part of who you are. Your friends are a part of who you are. Your family is a part of who you are. And I think sometimes in athletics, we give people the message that you've got to put everything into your sport and push everything else off to the side. Um, and I think it's really healthy to set priorities and boundaries in a lot of areas of our life. And it's, I didn't really learn this until later on, but I really believe it's acceptable to set goals that accommodate the balance that we're trying to achieve in life. Um, you know, for instance, as an adult, I still find myself being competitive, but I set some boundaries around it. I say, you know, I want to stay fit and competitive. Um, but I acknowledge that my athletics takes a backseat to my work and family life, and I only have X amount of time to put into it, and, and that's fine. Um, so I think as an athlete, it might be, you know, my school is important to me, my family is important to me, I've got to find out how these things balance. Could I be um, a more dedicated athlete if I pushed all this other stuff away? Maybe so, but I wouldn't be a healthy person, and you've got to find that dynamic that really works for you. Um, and really work that into the way your athletics is. Um, and then the other thing I would encourage, and this is more maybe for people who are kind of just nearing the end of their athletics. One thing that I observed is a lot of athletes who were, were very, very competitive athletes and in, in, in my sport in cross country skiing, it was athletes trying to make the US ski team who were trying to do it for years and years and years and um, not really making any money at it and not quite making that jump, but just kind of living in a parent's basement or, you know, trying to just work some real dead end jobs for quite a few years just to make enough to keep pursuing the dream. Um, and I sort of looked at that from the outside and I said, you know, I don't really, I don't want that to be my experience. Um, so what I did is I really thought about what goals I really wanted to achieve and maybe some goals I had that I decided I could let go of and I achieved some of those goals and I let some of them go. But one thing that I really did do is I stepped away from the sport without any regrets. I was really happy with what I got. Um, I stepped away from it. I never looked back and said, what if I had done this or maybe I should still try and do this. And I think that was really valuable to me in making family life work because I wasn't uh, my identity wasn't tied up in my athletics anymore. That was sort of separate, separated away. And I was able to really be the husband and father that I needed to be when I had young kids. Um, so I think that dynamic of transitioning out of athletics into what your life, whatever that's going to look like afterwards, it's important to think through because I think especially athletes that take it to a very high level, get their identity tied up in it, and they have a hard time figuring out how to transition away from it. Um, and I wouldn't say it was perfectly easy for me, but I, I do feel like I was able to make that transition in a healthy way. And my observation is that I've seen a number of people who have really struggled to make that transition in a healthy way. That's awesome. All right. Well, last thing then for you, Tori, um, anything um, you would like to add, anything I didn't ask you um, that you would like to talk about um, 
I'll give you the floor here and, and you could just uh, talk away. <laughs> well, sounds great. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed a lot of the questions that you presented to me today. I think they really opened the dialogue for me to share just from my life experience. And I appreciate that because I think my life is about more than just a few athletic accomplishments that I've had. Um, I would say I would be really remiss to not uh, mention my faith. Um, my relationship with Jesus Christ is and has been for quite some time a very important part of my life. Um, it's colored how I approach my athletics and my job and my family and my marriage and it continues to, to guide all aspects of my life. So that's something I would encourage um, anyone listening to really just consider uh, where they're at in their faith journey and consider a relationship with Jesus Christ because it's really made um, my life a much more uh, joyous life um, and, and brought fullness to my life. So I'd be remiss to not mention that. Um, beyond that, uh, just I appreciate this time. I have a lot of great memories from my time in Hastings. Um, I'm super, uh, you know, it's a great town and I'm not far from there now. I'm just up the river in Bayport. It's a great area. My, I feel like my roots are so deep that I couldn't really leave without kind of this draw to pull me back. Um, so I love the area and I'm super fortunate that I've had a blessed life to be in the sports I'm in and have the people, the teammates and the coaches around me. So thanks for giving the, me this opportunity to, to kind of talk about all of them and share my experiences. No worries. No, I, I, I appreciate your time as well. Um, yeah, it's nice to kind of um, look back. Uh, I mean, I walk in the high school every day and I, and I see the pictures up on the wall of our state champs. So um, it's nice to kind of connect uh, and, and actually put a face to those pictures, you know, and uh, there's always a story behind them too, you know, so it's nice to hear the story and uh, hear about the histories of, of Hastings, you know, and, and um, kind of put all that information together. So no, I appreciate you for, for doing this for us. Thank you, Tori. Absolutely. Best wishes for uh, the wrestling season coming up for you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. All right.